<laughs> it's crazy to me how long people have been working. You do not look old enough to have been working no, for this dude no, for 30 no, years. That's for sure. Like, yeah, not at all. So anyway, you'll help us. <laughs> I know you'll help us. Do you have a specific question um, that you prepared for? Uh, yeah, what the heck? Is that good enough? That is. All right. I will uh, have an answer for what the heck. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order on Monday, the 6th of March at 7.01 p.m. And I'd certainly like to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask Councilman Davis if you would lead us in the pledge. <coughs> Madam Clerk, we call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Temp Cole McFadden. Present. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Moffitt. Here. Council Member Reese. Here. And Council Member Shul. Thank you. Uh, let me ask first are there comments by members of the council? Yes. I recognize Council Davis, the Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member Moffitt, in that order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my family and I have spent a considerable amount of time discussing the 2017 municipal elections in Durham. After careful consideration of many factors, I want to take this moment to announce that I will not be a candidate for re-election. Although I continue to enjoy the work of the council immensely, I am looking forward to the pursuit of several civic, personal, and family projects over the course of the next few years. With almost five months before the opening of the filing period, I want to alert potential candidates that the next Ward 2 contest will not include an incumbent. Even though I will not be a candidate for re-election, I want to assure my colleagues and the residents of Durham that my continuing work on the council will be conducted with the very same rigor as a candidate who would be seeking re-election. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to make this announcement at this time. Well, you're quite welcome in there. I would have to say it comes as a surprise. Uh, you serve this council and the city admirably during the time that you've been there, and uh, we all wish you the best, and I'm sure you've made a decision that you feel is in your best interest and your family's best interest, but uh, I certainly have appreciated serving with you. Thank you. Yes, we are shocked by that news. Um, but I know Harriet will keep you busy. 
this is what I wanted to say. I wanted to thank, where's Beverly? Beverly and all of her staff for the outstanding work they did on that magnificent State of the City address and program. It was wonderful, and Mr. Mayor, we were just honored to be a part of that. Also, I want to congratulate the chief on receiving recognition honors two Sundays in a row. I was uh, at a function yesterday uh, because I was on program celebrating uh, Women's History Month, and she was one of the honorees. So, Chief, we have to congratulate you. And then last Sunday, she was among uh, honorees uh, at Antioch Baptist Church. So, you're well known in this city, county, state, country, world. <laughs> Congratulations on, on your uh, work. And I was glad that I was able to participate in the event yesterday because there were about 10 black boys serving as ushers, a part of the Thomas mentoring program. And so they actually escorted all of the honorees in, and I was escorted by one of them, and I had a chance to give all of them warm fuzzes. And that, that's what we need to do uh, with these boys. And I think that's it, Mr. Mayor. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, thank you. Um, Councilman Davis, Eddie, I, I'm, I'm saddened. And um, I know that you would have approached the decision with, with careful thought, prayerful thought, and I honor that. But um, I've enjoyed working with you, and I'm glad that we'll be working together for another year. So. The, um, I also want to thank the, I'll take a moment to thank the chief. I was at uh, the Durham Can, with a number of my colleagues were there as well. The Durham Can um, meeting on immigration yesterday, and I know that <clears throat> your presence and the leadership that you're providing the department um, speaks volumes to the immigrants in our community. That this is a city uh, that welcomes everyone, and that it's a city where we honor all of our brothers and sisters. So thank you for that. Um, I want to also just appreciate Durham Public Schools and all the students there who participated in the evening of entertainment. On Friday night, I'm embarrassed to say it's the first time I've been there, and it was so much fun. Um, there were uh, elementary school students, middle school students, high school students, and um, if you've ever seen the television show Glee, they've got nothing on, on evening of entertainment. It was a, it was a great time. <clears throat> Finally, I need to ask my colleagues, I'm, I'm not sure if I've missed a council meeting to, to date, but I'm going to do it in style. I'm going to miss the uh, coffee with council at PAC 5 the work session on Thursday, and the coffee with council at PAC 4. Um, I hasten to say I've already uh, asked Mr. Chestnut to forgive my absence, <coughs> but um, I would uh, appreciate excused absence for those three meetings. So move, Mr. Mayor, if it's appropriate. I'm proud to move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? <coughs> open the vote. Close the vote. The motion passes 6-0. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry to miss all those meetings. I have a couple of other jobs, and one of them is pulling me out of town for the weekend. Thank you. That, that vote was 7-0, to zero, I'm pretty sure. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, are there other announcements? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I was at that event, and I forgot to mention uh, the talent in the Durham Public Schools. The kids were awesome. They don't like for you to call them kids. Uh, the youth and teens were awesome. Well, I, I don't normally talk about everything I've been to on, during the week, and I'm sure all of us go to a lot of things, but uh, I think that was a special shout out to the Durham Public Schools. Uh, it was an amazing program. And then uh, Saturday, over at Haytai Heritage Center, I know I was there and Councilwoman Johnson was there. Uh, students from Southern High School in conjunction with work they've done at Duke University. Another display of uh, really amazing talent. So if anyone has any doubt about the value of arts in our schools, you just need to see what's happening 
in the Durham Public Schools. I talk about good things happening in our community. Uh, good things are very much happening in Durham Public Schools, especially when you look at the type of activity and performances that our students are able to give. Um, This morning I worked with uh, Mills on Wheels and <clears throat> on the assembly line were students from the University of Georgia who are in Durham for a whole week and their uh, focus is on um, food justice. It was just amazing to see uh, how they worked this morning and amazing to see how much energy is expended um, uh, uh, in that assembly line. And then I did go out and help to serve uh, four or five uh, citizens as well. And they're expecting one, two, th at least three more of us uh, at some time in the future. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Uh, are you sure? I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I just want to share with the council, um, uh, I have a letter that I have prepared with, for the, with Senator Berger, and it relates to a recent bill that has been introduced, Senate Bill 145, and it was supposedly introduced because of some comments that have been made by law enforcement agents, they don't say who the law enforcement agents are, uh, speaking about the fact that cities such as Durham have made public statements casting doubt on their willingness to abide by the law uh, relative to an enforcement of the applicable federal and state laws regarding Im immigration. And I just felt it was appropriate that we set the record straight in terms of what the city of Durham has done and has not done, and particularly since it was uh, issued as a press release and one of the so-called so -called reasons for uh, the law of SB, the state Senate Bill 145 was because of uh, actions uh, taken by the city of Durham. And they, they included two other cities. I can't speak for other cities, but I can definitely speak for Durham. So this letter will be going out uh, tomorrow and uh, all of you will have, have copies on it uh, when, it's, when it's sent out. Uh, ha having said that, uh, we'll move to the agenda. I'll first ask, are there prior times by the city manager, acting city manager, one of Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I do have one priority item this evening. The administration recommends that agenda item number five, the establishment of service area and service area fee for the Farrington, Ro Farrington Road waterline extension uh, be referred back to us for further work. Yes, sir. And, and other? That, 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 that is all. Uh, entertain a motion on the city manager's priority items. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote and close the vote? Motion passes 7 0. Uh, likewise, recognize the city attorney for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda as printed. And the first item is the consent agenda. As you know, the consent agenda consists of items that may be passed by single vote uh, if a member of the council or member of the audience pulls one of the consent agenda items. We will discuss that later in the agenda and I will read the heading of each consent agenda. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item three is the last mile agreement between the city of Durham and the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Item four is contract amendment number one with Center Grove for valve solids, dewatering, hauling, disposal, land application, and associated services. Item five is establishing a service area and service fee, area fee for the Farrington Road waterline extension, and that's being referred back to the administration. <coughs> Item six is state contract purchase for replacement HD video cameras for the Go Durham buses. Item seven is a bid term contract for sodium chloride, which is a road salt. Item eight is bid term contract for aggregates. Item nine is the cooperative purchase for replacement street sweepers. Item 10 is FY 2016-2017 second quarter financial report. Item 11 is human resources agreement with the Mercer Group, Inc. Item 12 is contract SW 60-2017 sidewalk repairs with Brow 
Construction Company. Item 13 is utility extension agreement with Clara and Sally Atkins, individuals to serve 4129 Old Road. Item 14 is Environmental Systems Research Institute Software Maintenance Service Agreement. Items 16 and 17 are items that can be found on the general business agenda. And item 18 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. I uh, entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda items with the exception of item five. So moved, Mr. Mayor. It's been propped and moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. We move to the general business agenda, item 16, 2016, annual crime report presentation. I recognize uh, Chief Davis. Good evening, everyone. This report will cover the department's six performance measures, part one index crime, violent crime, property crime, clearance rates, response time to priority one calls and staffing. Additional statistics and fourth quarter highlights and activities are also included in your accompanying document. Before I get started, I know we've done some restructuring and reorganizing in, in the department, so what I wanted to do just put a face behind some of the responsibilities in the department right now. So I've brought the leadership with me, and tonight we have Deputy Chief Rick Pendergrass, who is over operations, who's very familiar with operations. Raise your hand, Rick. Thank you. And Deputy Chief Anthony Marsh, who is not here. He has um, historically taken on many of the administrative uh, responsibilities, but he is also taking on administrative and investigations um, bureau as well. Assistant Chief Sarvis, Investigations Bureau. Assistant Chief D.C. Allen, who is Support Services Bureau. Assistant Chief Todd Rose, Patrol Services Bureau. Captain Marianne Bond, she is the Executive Assistant to the Chief. And Will Glenn, who is our Public Affairs Manager. And not to leave out Mr. Burwell, who has a very important role in the department. He is over our budgeting and fiscal over administrative services bureau. Thank you. I'm gonna start with part one index crime, property and violent crime. Part one index crimes consist of violent crime plus property crimes. Overall part one crime was down by 4% in 2016. Crime was down in four categories, aggravated assault, larceny, burglary, and overall part one property crime. Part one index crime, part one violent crime per 100,000, as you see in the purple, the upper band was down by 9% in Durham since 2000. Part one property crime in the blue area per 100,000 was down by 49% in Durham since 2000. This is a historical low for property crime in the city. The aggregate total of crime victimization in Durham through this period continues to be on the decline. Violent crime was up by 2%, driven largely by a 17% increase in robbery. A robbery task force was formed in early November to focus on the uptick in these robberies throughout the city. The task force focuses on commercial robberies and robberies committed with firearms. Investigators work closely with the crime analysts and investigators from other agencies throughout the triangle. Since November, task force investigators have charged 46 suspects with more than 60 charges. Several have been charged with multiple robberies. The task force has taken in over 200 cases in the last three months. 68% of robberies involved guns, 63% were of individuals, and 23% were commercial. There were four bank robberies included in these numbers. Part one, violent crime. Aggravated assaults were down 
by 6%. this closer and need my glasses on, excuse me. The number of total aggravated assault incidents were down very slightly. 41% of 2,000, of 2016 aggravated assaults involved multiple victims, firearm incidents, down from 44% in 2015. 42 homicides were committed in 2016. We count 43, but one of those homicides, uh, the individual um, homicide was resolved, was committed in one year, and the actual expiration of that individual occurred in 2016. Three were self-defense, two occurred in prior years, 38 of these cases involved firearms, six were domestic violence. As for the disposition of homicide cases, arrests have been made in 21 cases and three ruled self-defense. There are currently 16 open cases from 2016. Seven cold cases were cleared in 2016 Six were from 2015 and one was from 2013 of those cold cases. In addition to forming the robbery task force, the department began holding weekly crime abatement meetings as opposed to the monthly crime abatement meetings to have more of a handle on crime trends in a more real time fashion as opposed to discussing uh, crime trends after a 30-day period. This has helped us to uh, deploy officers and make adjustments to our strategies, our crime strategies, as we see crime trends occurring. Investigators also, during the holiday season, wore uniform, and um, I, I, I was reminded that I was supposed to report on that 60-day initiative. During the 60 days, uh, during that period when officers were in uniform, there was a reduction, an additional reduction in property crimes. However, our violent crimes remain the same. We still feel like that is a, a very positive and strategic um, maneuver anytime we need more visibility and we will continue to um, implement our holiday plan with our officers in uniform. Part one, Chief, property Chief, crime. Chief, Chief. Yes, sir. Are you going to give us those <coughs> numbers in that 60 day period? I don't need them now if you got them, actual numbers. I, I can absolutely okay. get them All for right. you, sir. Thank you. Part one, property crime and burglaries were at a 20 year low in 2016. We have continued our residential awareness program, which is a RAP program initiative which focuses on burglary prevention. The program success is attributed to the use of prevention and awareness strategies. Our community resource unit has been active in crime prevention, activities, residential surveys, and other initiatives to prevent property crime. We're using our crime mapping data and social media platforms such as Nextdoor to get the word out about crime trends and get our community members more involved in their neighborhood watch programs. We continue to urge residents to join Neighborhood Watch programs and call 911 to report suspicious activity. There are currently 185 active Neighborhood Watch programs throughout the city. The active and engaged eyes and ears of the community has undoubtedly contributed to the reduction in property crimes. Part one, property crimes. Burglaries were down 19%, 82% were residential. Most stolen items and burglaries included television sets, electronics, computer equipment, and tools. Larcenies were down by 1%. 41% of larcenies are auto parts from vehicles. 28% of larcenies involve shoplifting. The most stolen items and burglaries included phones, money, purses, and computer equipment. 
motor vehicle thefts were up by 15%. Honda Accords continue to be the most stolen vehicle in the city of Durham. Approximately 15% of vehicles during 2016 had the keys in the ignition and the motor running. Let that be a crime prevention tip. <laughs> Chief, uh, yes, sir. Council, Council Member Johnson does have a Honda Accord, but she <laughs> assures me she did not leave the key in the ignition. You might want to get rid of it. <laughs> Motor vehicle thefts have been on the decrease over several years, but for some reason this year we saw an uptick in motor vehicle thefts. We continue to uh, get the word out about, especially during the winter months is when we saw uptick. Individuals want to leave their cars running, get them warm uh, before they go to work or whatever. Just not the thing to do. Just stick it out, put your, put your muffins on and everything. So crime reduction strategies. Um, during 2016, supplemental patrols. Our heat teams are now our slide units, which supplement our staffing. We have been using lap salaries to pay for supplemental patrols when needed, and we have a, the new slide unit to ensure we uh, have officers available in the most needed areas. Directed foot patrols in high crime areas has also helped. Weekly crime abatement meetings, as I mentioned before. We also do um, bi-weekly conference calls in the morning to discuss um, via conference with commanders what occurred over a 24 hour period or a 48 hour period so that we can stay on top of our, our uh, crime trends and issues that we might need to deal with on a day to day basis. Uniform deployment, I mentioned that, plain clothes staff. We plan to expand that not just during the holiday but uh, we are working on a um, scheduling plan now to deploy more of our administrative staff. Uh, I mentioned that in the retreat. Tomorrow we'll have a presentation to discuss what that looks like and we're hoping that by expanding our arms just a little bit, we can get more out of our staff and have more visibility during the times that we need it. 9-11 and CAD techs were also implemented. Uh, what we have done now is all of the commanders, captains, um, deputy chiefs, assistant chiefs, and all critical um, staff members are now receiving CAD techs real time through their cell phones. So that instead of waiting for a watch report, they receive information about critical incidents real time and I have to thank uh, our 911 system, um, Director Sukup, who sat with us to talk about how we could facilitate that, make that happen, and his staff has done that and has been very helpful in getting real-time information out to these individuals who know how to maneuver and make things happen when we see critical incidents. Targeted special operations, focusing on aggravated assaults and robberies, have in, in the most impacted areas have also been uh, quite beneficial. We have run um, two 60-day details in the last six months that basically targeted the areas where we've had the most uh, upticks in some of, some of the districts where we've seen repeat trends. Clearance rates. During 2016, the Durham Police Department's clearance rates were above the FBI clearance rates for similar sized cities in homicide, rape, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and part one property crime. The FBI clearance rates are for cities the size of Durham with populations of 100,000 to 250,000 residents. We feel that possible causes of uh, lower violent crime clearances as the change in trend, the number of robberies, uh, to be quite frank, our suspects are quite clever in the manner in which they uh, commit commercial robberies, uh, not in motor vehicles, leaving um, a scene of a commercial robbery on foot and being transported at another location. Uh, so some of the, the maneuvers and the strategies that our current uh, suspects are utilizing, we're having to uh, 
uh, adjust ourselves and our visibility in certain areas so that we can be in commercial corridors and more visible. This has been impactful, but we still have work to do as it relates to our robberies. And we realize that the robbery task force has been uh, very critical in helping us to solve some of, the, some of our robberies and not just uh, arresting individuals, but those individuals have been associated with bands and, and robberies that have occurred in other cities in the area as well. Priority one calls for service and response times. Our desired target of responding to 57% of priority one calls in under five minutes was not met. However, 51.2% were answered in under five minutes, and we are working towards that 57% goal. We were unable to meet our 5.8 minute average citywide response time target. The average response time was 6.3 minutes. DPD experienced an 8% increase in priority one calls for service in 2016 over 2015. Priority one calls have increased 32% since 2014, which is significant. We have begun discussions to further examine beat redesign and alignment to improve response times and service delivery. Supplemental patrols in our new slide units have been assigned to ensure beat integrity when and wherever needed so that we can improve upon our response times as well. Our staffing level sworn staffing at the end of the fourth quarter was 89% with 59 vacancies. Current staffing is at 504 with 43 vacancies. We gained 16 sworn officers. We added 15 COPS grant positions in December 2016, bringing us to a 547 authorized positions. 36% of sworn officers live within city limits during the fourth quarter. A BLET class of 11 graduated in February. There's currently a BLET class of 23 recruits, which started in February. We will start our first ALEC class, first time in five years, in a few months. This is a faster way to get experienced North Carolina certified officers on the street through an abbreviated academy. People are stealing from us, so we plan to steal back. So we believe that new recruiting bonuses, including uh, pay incentives, um, a signing bonus, relocation bonus, as well as the uh, annual 5% increases for officers will encourage longevity in our department and encourage officers to make a career with the Durham Police Department and stay here and serve this city. We're also working very hard to uh, identify homegrown recruits, Durham grown. So we plan to look at our Explore programs and even extending the age range from 17 to identify individuals that haven't made it to college yet that are contemplating what their future will be and give them opportunities to come into criminal justice. So um, we also uh, have um, implemented a shoe bonus. Believe it or not, officers um, weren't provided their shoes in the past, so now along with their uniforms, we have uniform shoes as well. That might not sound like much, but to them it's a big deal. Non-sworn staffing was at 89.5% with 13 vacancies. At the end of the fourth quarter, there are currently 17 non-sworn vacancies in the police department. So fourth quarter highlights. Patrol officers received the first take-home patrol vehicles in October. These marked units are being assigned to patrol officers who live within the city of Durham. The department hopes uh, the cars will serve as an incentive for officers to live within the city limits and be engaged in their communities to foster safe neighborhoods. Take-home cars also benefit the community as a, a potential high-visibility crime deterrent. 
The department plans to assign 28 more vehicles in the next couple of months and 34 additional cars during each of the next two fiscal cycles. The robbery task force I already mentioned, uh, which uh, I discussed earlier, uh, was formed in early November and focuses on the increase in robberies and has proven to be a critical asset to the criminal investigations operation. Uh, these investigators are highly talented and have done phenomenal work since the, the inception. The department continues to move forward with our reorganization. We have implemented the new slide squad, which, which shores up our staffing. And lastly, during the fourth quarter, numerous sworn and non-sworn employees reached out to the community with various and numerous holiday initiatives. You can read more about those initiatives in the written report. Some of the new technology and training. The Durham Police Department is striving to be a leader in community policing, and we realize that cultivating a force of highly trained and skilled officers is essential to our success. We're providing extensive training related to fair and impartial policing, including classes focused on procedural justice and de-escalation. We're also participating in a new program called ICAT, Integrating Communications, Assessment, and Tactical. This particular program is a national model that helps officers think in terms of other alternatives to force. We're evaluating other courses to bring to Durham, including those focused on leadership development and practical skills training. We're also excited about our new reality-based simulator. This is a, a photograph of it, and I encourage anybody who has, who has not been over to see it to come out and try it out. This simulator uh, presents officers with various types of scenarios for them to make quick decisions about what is most appropriate to do in critical situations. Every situation does, does not necessarily require equipment, it does not necessarily require um, the officer to use anything on his tool belt. Sometimes the scenario requires the officer to use commands, various types of commands. And um, keeping in mind the, um, the escalation of force is something that can be managed by the officer through training and through constant practice evaluating various types of scenarios. And this machine is one that um, presents just a myriad of scenarios for officers. During um, the last couple of months and during our Citizens Police Academy, the members that graduated were actually able to be the first to try out the simulator. We also allowed our news media on Media Day to try out the simulator as well. It was an eye-opening experience for them. In January, the Durham Police Department launched its new Police to Citizen online service. This is an automated service where citizens can actually go online and fill out police reports that would have otherwise been dispatched to a police officer. This is a way for us to better utilize our resources on the street, keep officers responding to calls where there really requires an officer's presence. And it's, if a person requests an officer, they can absolutely have an officer respond. But this is an option for citizens to be able to fill out police reports for larcenies and other minor types of police reports to free up our police officers. We plan to have a more expanded campaign uh, after we, we get done with our pilot. We're trying to iron out the kinks and make sure that the technology is working the way it should and, um, and do a full-blown campaign as it relates to the uh, police to citizen program. We launched our body-worn cameras in December. Currently, patrol officers in District 1 and investigators with the traffic and crash team are wearing body cameras. We started outfitting District 4 uh, just a couple of weekends ago with cameras during the last week in February. Improving community relations 
our new liaison positions. I mentioned them before, but these officers, uh, our LGBT uh, liaison and also our Hispanic liaison have been very involved in the community. These are critical times where it's important for the police department to have boots on the ground that specifically address the concerns of the very unique communities in which we serve. We're introducing performance metrics as a good way to help us track our community outreach efforts as well. UN50, we work with this organization which gives presentations about citizens' rights and police protocols. UN50 has been all over the, me uh, the Metro uh, Durham area and has done presentations at Merck and at corporate businesses, at schools, at churches, and we have been in attendance with our community services uh, folks to be there to answer questions that, that um, participants may have about UN50. Coffee Cops and Conversations, we participated in these community events and, and we appreciate the support we've gotten from council. At those events, a good way for commanders and officers to get to know the community members and address any concerns or issues. And recently we um, uh, began lunches um, in McDougal Terrace, one of our captains, uh, Captain Edwards, who is over that district, has actually began to participate in conversations and luncheons, lunches in that district. And I believe this is my last slide. Some of the future focus is our Police Athletic League, uh, enhancing that, uh, staffing our gang and gun task force, um, and current, uh, consistently working to enhance the relationship with our federal partners, and that would be the ATF, because um, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms um, um, agents are working closely with us to try to deal with the surge of weapons that we're seeing on the streets. And that surge of weapons is not just here in the city of Durham, it is all over the country. And um, much of that is associated with gang violence as well. So uh, the gang and gun task force will be working closely with these other federal agents so that we can get our arms around some of the individuals and groups that come together for the purpose of committing violent crimes. Uh, our enhanced community outreach, I mentioned that. We plan to deploy and satellite our Citizens Police Academy so community members don't just come to us that we can go out into the community and hold various types of instruction which would be beneficial and educational not just for citizens but for our police officers as well in churches, in uh, various environments that welcome us to have our Citizens Police Academy um, presentations. We plan to expand our social media network, next door, our Twitter, and try to get the word out about what we're doing in the Durham Police Department in a myriad of different ways to include printed material, material that is um, not just in English but also in Spanish so that we can communicate um, broadly to various audiences. Um, and at this time, that concludes my report and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Chief. Um, are there questions, comments from recognized Councilman Shule? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, great report. Um, I think that I just want to appreciate in general, before I have some specific comments and questions, but your emphasis on trust building and the kind of activities that you've done, uh, appointing the liaison officers for the Hispanic community, the LGBTQ community. Those are important outreach and trust building efforts. Uh, and I thought you were uh, just did a great job at the Durham CAN meeting the other night, uh, the other afternoon, uh, where I think it's already been mentioned that there were probably, I think, 1,300 people there, and uh, many of them very fearful, given the uh, concerns about immigration enforcement at the federal level. And I just thought you did a great job of expressing our city's position. I think you 
made the right call on the on the checkpoints and am appreciative of that and uh, I think that I mean, those are hard decisions, but I think you're, you've done a great job of making really good decisions, and um, I'm really appreciative. The, um, I also want to say that I, I think that the, the – I'm really glad that you all have introduced the procedural justice training. I think a lot of people don't understand procedural justice and know a lot about it. Um, I know that it is geared towards making people feel like the, the – criminal justice system from their first contact with a police officer, and that's what you all are concerned with, but all the way through the system, they're treated with fairness, and that the process is fair, that their voice is heard, that they are respected during any encounter, uh, and that uh, they are, their humanity is recognized, and that they can be a part of what is going on, and that they're respected. And I think that's so important um, that that, that I think that's just Im important for our whole criminal justice system, but I'm appreciative that you all have introduced that training for our department, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great step. Thank you. It will be ongoing. That's great. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, we have a lot of initiatives that uh, the bonuses, the, the pay raises, the take-home cars and so forth, and just in particular, you mentioned the percentage of our officers that are living in the city now, but I missed that. Could you say what that was again? I think it was like 39 percent. 39? Yeah. Okay. And um, have you had, do we know yet, have we had any effect that you can tell yet of the take-home car and the bonus and that sort of thing for living inside the city? Have we had any, any effect of that at this point? Well, it's, it's still relatively fresh. Uh, seven cars are out there right now. Of okay. course, you know, um, there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with having a vehicle that the officer can take home. We plan to find ways for the officers not just to enjoy the benefit of it, but to engage in the community as much as possible. Um, it's a huge benefit, and to, and I mentioned at the retreat, to even, you know, find ways to come back, support programs, uh, in the city on the weekends and become more involved. Just having transportation to do that mm -hmm. is, is a huge incentive. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to the long-term trend on that, and, and I hope that what we've done will be helpful. I think the next 28 vehicles, which will go out in, in really less than 60 days, mm -hmm. 28 vehicles in the city, is that's going to be huge. Great. Great. And the... McDougal Terrace, the lunch is there. Um, have, that's already started? Yes, sir. And are people coming to meet Captain Edwards? or? And I asked Captain Edwards, he says some days are light, mm -hmm. and then some days he has larger crowds, but mm -hmm. they plan to continue. He's working really Good. closely with the Housing Authority Great. on that initiative. That mm -hmm. was an initiative that um, he came up with, Great. Uh, with his staff. Great. The... Um, I wanted to mention the report, the, the larger report, there's so much in it, um, and I urge anybody who uh, is interested in these things to read the report, the long uh, list of uh, difficult crimes solved and, and, uh, and, and bravery, uh, as well as the tremendous amount of outreach that's going on and the uh, exceptional community involvement of some of your officers. And one of the things I wanted to mention in uh, Mayor Pro Tem mentioned this not long ago, but uh, the CIT officers who were involved in the homeless outreach, yes. the, um, I have heard now a couple of times from the homeless advocates that, that they are so uh, in such a good alliance with your officers who are doing that, and the, the nonprofits that are doing that work have said to me now a couple of times just in, in passing how great it is that that relationship exists. So I hope good. you'll pass that on. Yeah, thank you, that's good to know. The, the officers that are assigned to that team that are out there on a regular basis, just my interaction with them, they have a passion yeah. for that work, mm -hmm. uh, which makes a huge difference in how they're received. So um, I'll make sure that I let them know. Yeah, thank you. I noticed one thing just from the, the longer report on page 24. Cocaine seized in 2016, 
was 22 times the amount that was seized a year or than it was seized a year earlier. That 22 times more. Is there something going on in Durham? Uh, you know that is that that's. Or is there something particular to Durham that's making that happen? Or that's a those are federal. Thank you. Okay, those are federal seizures. So. Um, because they're task force officers working with the federal government, it's no telling they may not have been seized here in Durham. Isn't that correct? Or is that just here in Durham? It's here in Durham? Okay. So those are operations and sometimes long-term operations mm -hmm. that occurred with the federal task force. So it could be somebody on I-85, though, or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what is U and 5 -O? It is um, a group that have come together, uh, retired chief of police, um, Chalmers, and um, retired see. deputy chief, um, mm -hmm. uh, BJ Council, okay. who came up with the concept. Um, ha they have a very good understanding of um, you know, law enforcement operations, uh, what's, what's, what the position of law enforcement should be and a very a very strong interest in the community and young people in the community to help them have safe encounters. Yeah. So um, their presentation um, goes over really well mm -hmm. with not just young people but with adults as well. Great. Mm -hmm. And then my last question is um, about a year ago or maybe a little longer than that we had the report from I think it was the IACP. Yes. Uh, not sure I have those initials right, but we um, we had a, a lot of ideas for reform in that, and it was maybe a little before you came uh, to Durham. And I'm wondering, um, are you all using that uh, as you know? Is that offering you any useful guidance at this point? Absolutely, it is. We've already um, actually implemented some of the suggestions. Uh, some some of the suggestions were were a bit obvious as far as uh, reallocating manpower to certain areas, um, looking at our beat alignment, looking at the department structure as well. We are absolutely, absolutely using that document. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Well, Chief, thank you very much. Again, I just want to appreciate the emphasis on the community outreach that you personally do and that I see these folks everywhere. I, I, st I saw Captain Bond Gosh, probably five places in the last yeah. week. Uh, and just uh, really think that that is a, just a, a great way of operating. And I think it's, the community knows it and appreciates it. And so I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. They're a great team. Thank you, Councilman Shule. Other, other comments? Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you for your report. Um, I would like to congratulate you and your team on the difference that you're making. Um, in my conversations with the community, they have the utmost respect for you and your team and all the officers out there trying to be guardians rather than warriors. Sometimes we have to be warriors when we're dealing with warriors, but we're trying not to be warriors. That's correct, I think. Um, that's just my uh, <laughs> categorization. How are the kids doing, though, the young people? Well, you know, um, there's been a lot of discussion about our youth and our young people and various programs. We have some ideas in the police department uh, about outreach and how to reach out to some of our most I guess underserved community members, those those kids that that are vulnerable to some of the environment that they're exposed to, and we have a great interest in trying to uh, establish programs and relationships and exposure um, through our police athletic league, so that we can we can make some deliberate attempts to divert uh, some of the negative influences uh, that they're exposed to. And I, but, I, but we're only we're only one entity. I know. You know? I know. 
and I know that it is a community responsibility to do something to save our kids. It's our responsibility, and we cannot look uh, to you and your staff to raise them, to discipline them. We've got to be positive role models and uh, haven't taken interest in them through our churches, sororities, fraternities, other organizations that we're a part of. Um, if we don't, we're going to continue to lose them. Thank you for your work and your team. Thank you for your work. I, I'm reminded of my son when I see um, Captain Sarvis and Deputy Chief uh, Pentegrass because they are his uh, classmates. And so it, it's good to see uh, how your la lives have evolved over the last however many, I won't say how many years, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, Chief, thank you. Thank Appreciate you, sir. It. Item 17 is a proposed stormwater permit modifications and associated ordinance revisions. Good evening, Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. Uh, this item is on GBA tonight at uh, Council's direction. Uh, there is no formal staff presentation, but uh, a variety of staff are available to answer any questions Council may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know, Steve, you asked for it to be on the GBA. That's why I was looking to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I thought this was complicated at the work session. And then we got another memo from you all. I wasn't sure if it made it more complicated or less complicated, Bob. Uh, but um, could you explain the import? So, so when we were, my under, let, me, let me state my understanding and then you can tell me if I'm wrong, um, which there's a 56% there's a chance that I am. Um, but my understanding is that the Chapel Hill and other f um, phase two ordinances were uh, about to, had, had been issued before, shortly before our work session, and that those ordinances had, uh, or those permits rather, had deleted, the, the, the uh, de department DEQ, state DEQ, had, had taken out references to nutrient controls and that we were therefore going to have an ordinance that was different than everyone else's and the staff was asking us to be in compliance with state law and state regulations and to essentially have an ordinance that was like everyone else's in that regard. But then, as I read this new memo, Chapel Hill and the other localities received a, between the work session and today, received a, an, an, a, a new version of their permit, which does still in, include this nutri these nutrient controls. And so I'm interested if that is a correct understanding. And uh, if, if it's not, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Uh, but also, um, what guidance in light of that you all will be offering? Bo Ferguson again, Deputy City Manager. So your timeline of events is correct. There was discussion at the work session of draft language that had been uh, seen on the DEQ website. However, as staff reported accurately at that meeting, that had not been included in any permits on Friday, the day after the work session, 
similar but not identical language did show up in the Chapel Hill permit. I believe we since verified is also included in the Burlington permit. Do I have that correct? Uh, the language uh, is, uh, was not immediately consistent with language that, uh, that uh, we are familiar with in other discussions of the Jordan Lake rules. And so at a meeting that uh, uh, the Senior Deputy City Attorney Don O'Toole attended last Thursday, we attempted to, to get clarity, he attempted to get clarity uh, from DEQ officials as to the potential intent of that language. Uh, and as he reported out in an email that I believe has been shared with council, uh, the officials he spoke with were not immediately familiar with that language uh, and therefore uh, did, were not able to provide guidance as to what it might mean. I think what we feel is, uh, is of note for the council is that this language uh, is not in our permit, uh, and we currently are not engaged in an effort, although this item before you uh, could begin an effort to revise our permit, uh, but we have not had any communication with DO DEQ that indicates that this language is forthcoming for all permits. Staff noted prior to this meeting that language has shown up in phase two communities. We are a phase one community, so there's another uh, uh, differentiation between those two. Uh, so the, the consensus analysis on the part of staff is that it is unclear what impact that new language might have and there is not sufficient uh, direction or guidance given to us to indicate that that language may be forthcoming in our permit. So we're not comfortable advising council that we believe the language is forthcoming or that we at this point can fully uh, specify what that language would accomplish. So does that mean that your guidance is the, the same recommendation that you were giving us at the work session then? That is correct, although I think I'd like to clarify that the recommendation we gave and the recommendation that's before you this evening is to authorize the city manager to pursue changes in our MPDES permit to eliminate, the, uh, to eliminate the conflict with state law. That is as far as the recommendation uh, went at the time. We did include in the uh, council packet draft changes to the ordinance that would accomplish that. However, I'd like to clarify that the ordinance is not under consideration. The ordinance could continue to be a point of conversation as would uh, any content in the MPDES permit. So at this point tonight, the only direction we are seeking is whether or not council authorizes the manager to begin that process. Uh, and if council wanted to provide specific direction uh, as to what content we saw or sought in that MPDES permit, we could still definitely be open to do so. Thank you. That gives me more comfort. Uh, because it, it honestly it's it's really hard to understand this stuff uh, and uh, it didn't get any easier this week when we got the new language and I read the new language and let's just say it's barely in English um, so I think that you know I'm definitely comfortable supporting the staff recommendation that we begin this process if, if that's my understanding that we authorize the manager to begin the process of the ordinance revision is that that's your recommendation? recommendation okay thank you thank you mr. mayor could I, before I move you, Don, go back to the um, information that Steve spoke to on, from Chapel Hill? Um, could, could, could you, the only difference that I saw, and, and this related to post construction, runoff construction that the Chapel Hill article had in it, and the only difference that I saw in what they had initially and what they added on the 24th was a statement that says documentation shall be provided where it is not feasible to use storm water control measures that reduce nutrient loading. That's the only difference that I saw, but, and I don't know if anybody could speak to that. I don't know what kind of documentation, what, what all that meant, but what, when, when I compare what was in the article, Section F, post-construction runoff controls, which leads, starts off by, re, by reading pursuant to 15, blah, 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 and ends by saying fulfill the nutrient loading reduction requirement. 
and then when I look at what they, the language they had in, on February 24th, the only difference in the two was the statement that I just read, documentation shall be provided where it is not feasible to use stormwater control measures that reduce nutrient loading. Paul Weebke, Public Works. Um, it is somewhat unclear. Sometimes when they make vague references like that, they're referring to the, the chance that you might not be able to implement a stormwater control measure that's specifically proficient at removing nutrients. If there are soil conditions or site conditions that might preclude a, a development from doing so, uh, in other aspects it might be referring to, um, well, in that, in that specific regard, that's most likely what they're referring to. But again, we're somewhat uncertain as to what that may specifically mean. Sometimes it can mean other things, and what those are is only in the mind of the person that wrote that particular. So you just shared that with, with us because you said something at one time, and now you're saying here's the latest information you have? Is, is that why you gave us this addendum? It's the latest information, yes, yeah. in terms of what language was put in their permit. Yeah. But does, does that doesn't, doesn't impact you, what you're recommending to us? No. Okay, that's what I want to get clear with. Okay, let me move to Councilman Moffitt. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, if I'm wrong, please forgive me, but uh, I, th I, th um, I think there's three layers here. The first layer was in the memo that we received uh, for tonight. It says that there was language available in draft permits. Then the next thing that the memo says is that the, the information that we received, which is the information the staff had, was that Chapel Hill's permit didn't include that language, is that right? It did not include it at all. And then they went forward and said actually the final permit, which was issued on Friday, did include the language with the small revision. Um, when you talk about phase one versus phase two community, and to be clear for people that are watching, we're talking about stormwater discharge permits, but that are national permits. Um, and our federal permit requires us to meet standards that state law forbids us from enforcing. So we have a, conf a conflict between federal and state law, and um, which is what they're trying to work out. But when we go to phase one, phase two communities, can you explain that just a little bit, somebody? Phase one communities were the first communities that were brought into the, the system where a federal permit was issued back in, for Durham, I believe, 1994. For cities over 100,000, okay. phase two just signals the next phase of that type of permit being issued to smaller communities, and I'm trying to remember. I guess it was under 100,000 uh, for those types of municipal for communities 100, under 100,000, I should say. Sometimes those permit requirements are different, recognizing that larger communities may be able to have more resources to deal with issues, and generally larger communities have larger more complex issues than smaller communities. So, so typically, if there was a difference between a larger community, smaller community permits, a larger community, community permits might be a little more stringent, have more requirements? Some, sometimes, in terms of monitoring and that sort of thing. Well, um, so tonight, now, I wanted to make sure, what, what you're looking for is our guidance, whether to ask the Division of Environmental Quality, NCDEQ, whether to allow us, us the city, to revise our NPDES permit. Is that right? Correct. And um, if we don't do that, then that permit's going to renew in next spring, early spring, and we'll be looking at all the language in that even as, as soon as this coming fall, September 1. That's when we'll submit for our renewal, right. correct? Okay, so, and um, just so that I'm clear, if we say, okay, go ahead and ask DEQ, the next step is to go to DEQ and say, we'd like to revise our permit this way, is that correct? Correct. And until DEQ signs off on that, we won't be revising any ordinances, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And um, I do want to say that um, one of the arguments I've heard about this is um, that we don't have parity currently with our neighboring communities that um, 
that we require stricter standards than anyone else in the, in the state right now, at least in the region is what I'd understood. Correct. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I understand that argument. When we get to a place where we're saying, well, we're not a phase two community, you know, we might have less stringent standards. I'm, I would, I could see us, I just would be, I would say in advance, I will be a little wary of that argument um, if we achieve parity. I'm not sure we need to go beyond that. But um, certainly asking DEQ what their intent is regarding our NPDES permit and you know whether they would permit us to modify it or modify it to what extent, I, I agree with my colleague, Councilman Shule, that that certainly doesn't seem to be a problem. The, the other advantage uh, that I see is that there's a six-month lead time, as I understand it. So if you didn't do anything, we would be required to look at it in 2018. But if you're going to do something, they're suggesting that you try to do it at least six months before that, and that's why we're back into the September date. I thought that's what I'm seeing here. Uh, otherwise, we, we're stuck where we are until 2018, even if we're going to propose any, any changes. Recognize Councilman Shul. Mr. Mayor, um, so that brings me to the question of what kind of timetable would you all be on in terms of a rewrite or a suggested rewrite of our permit and, or the questions that you're asking DEQ or what, what kind of timeline would that be on? Time frame as same time frame as we indicated at the work session. We fairly immediate that we would approach DEQ. Paul, to remind me of what that is. I'm sorry, I can't remember that time frame. Um, gosh, what is it? It loads fast enough. I'll pull it up. I'm sure it's in my memo here. Yeah, thank you. I see it now. Yeah. Shea Bullock, Public Works. We originally proposed to submit it after work session, um, went on to city council, so we would propose to submit it initially after we get guidance to move forward. And so, and, and okay, so my understanding is what we'd be doing is giving you all guidance to discuss this with DEQ and think about any ordinance rewrite that we, we might want to have. Is, do, am I right on that? Well, we would propose, along with the permit revisions, to submit ordinance revisions that go along with that to DEQ as well. Okay. I thought I had understood from Bo that these would be, that the, the manager would be looking at ordinance revisions. We can decouple that. I'll leave that to Brian. Yeah, yeah and, and I would want to clarify, I mean, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to hide the fact that reopening this question has the potential, as was frankly intended, to come into compliance with state law and by doing so uh, to shed some of the regulation that is, that is currently in our ordinance. So I don't want to suggest that we will have the ability to negotiate some separate and more stringent package uh, with DEQ that is in conflict with the state law that was passed. What I do intend, what, what I did intend to apply is there is interest on the part of council and frankly on the part of staff to understand the language that we have seen show up in these new permits and should that language be something that DEQ intends to make available to municipalities who are interested in uh, mirroring that language or potentially enforcing that language, we would be happy to, at council's direction with the consent of council, to see if that language is appropriate in our permit and to reflect our ordinance accordingly. What I don't want to, um, to sidestep though is this process could also, uh, as originally we uh, con uh, assumed it would, uh, to eliminate uh, much of the language that currently provides regulation in the Jordan Basin because 
uh, state uh, legislation was passed directing us to do so. So I, I don't want to yeah. soft pedal that, and I don't. Understood. If that is a potential outcome, I don't want that to come as a surprise. To right. Anyone. I think I appreciate that. I think that was clear, and I appreciate it. But what you were saying about the opportunity to improve our ordinance, and that is what you referred to at the end. Is that what you're referring to then at the end of the the memo that you added between now and the work session? I think there was similar language about that. I, I think what I what I feel like we have the flexibility to do in approaching DEQ is to get further clarification from staff who've drafted the permits that, that we we're referencing that includes the new language that we didn't have at the time of work session to see what their intent was uh, for that language and then to craft an ordinance that responds uh, and incorporates their intent uh, should that give us the opportunity uh, to enact some new set of regulations that does in fact comply with state law. I think what, what precipitated yeah. this was our being out of compliance with the state law. Okay. Okay, thanks. I recognize Councilman Moffitt and the Mayor Pro Tem and well let, let, let me let me since Don you've spoken, let me go to the Mayor Pro Tem and then Councilman Reeson and come back. I'm always anxious to hear the legal opinion on the subject. So I want Don O two uh, to send, I, I know we have Donald to be Donald from the city attorney's office. Give us your opinion on this. Well, I, I think what Bo just said is exactly right. Um, if what I'm hearing from council, the direction is to go to DEQ, um, given that we have a permit that incorporates ordinance provisions that DEQ and the EMC approved in 2012. So that that was deemed as being in compliance with the state law. And then in 2015, a law was changed that basically said no local government should enforce the Jordan Lake new development. So that's what started this process, mm -hmm. concern that the city's existing ordinance was out of um, compliance with state law. I will say that, um, you know, I know the mayor has focused on the first part of what's included in Chapel Hill and Burlington's permit, but if you look at the second part, that seems to imply that um, the, the language there that refers to a TMDL, well, Jordan Lake has a TMDL, and there seems to be some effort on the permit writer's part to incorporate some obligation to do something Jordan Lake related. So I'm, I'm still curious about the new language that Chapel Hill and Burlington has how that's in compliance with the 2015 state law. But I think, I think the direction that council is giving to staff is great because I, I think at the end of the day, it would be good for the city to go to DEQ and tell us what should our permit look like so that we're in compliance with state law in your opinion. Thank you for that. Recognize Council Marie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Don, could you come back up and we'll talk to you some more. Um, if that's what you're asking us to do, I don't understand the directive from staff here. If, you, if what I'm hearing from you is a little bit different from what I've heard from everybody else tonight. I'm perfectly comfortable having staff sit down with DEQ and figure out what a uh, stormwater ordinance would look like, what, a, what our a proper permit would look like for Durham to bring us under state law. I'm less, than com I'm less comfortable um, removing important protections for, for Jordan Lake that are currently existing in our permit that is currently valid that was approved. Um, and so, especially because the packet that came to us at the work session and the packet we have here tonight includes specific ordinance revisions that would remove those protections. That's right. So, so I, my, my assumption, and I don't know how many other folks thought this was true, was that, that this vote was, was to move forward with that. Uh, is that not the case? Are, are we going to, after, if, if everybody voted to approve this tonight, um, or s enough of us to move it forward, uh, would the city councils at some point later also vote on a set of ordinance revisions for the city of Durham? Correct. And, and to be fair, I think this item has sort of morphed slightly as the discussion has gone on. The ordinance provisions that were put together, which by the way took a lot of time on the part of staff, the goal of those ordinance provisions. Well, well, thank you for doing that. That was great. Um, the goal of those provisions was to try to develop code provisions 
that seemed to comply with state law. And so this was then presented at work session to seek counsel's input on, on whether they wanted staff to present these to DEQ and then if, if that happened, presumably DEQ would change the city's permit, um, give the city the blessing to adopt those ordinance provisions, and then those would need to be adopted by council. But I do think um, what I'm hearing tonight is more just to, to open a discussion with DEQ to point out that we have this 2015 session law. Um, Durham has its existing permit that incorporates its current code provisions. <coughs> And DEQ, tell us what you want us to do, given that you are in charge of this permit so that the city can comply with state law. If, if that's the purpose that you're coming to us tonight, then why do we need to vote on that? You're talking about sitting down with DEQ to, to find out how to bring ourselves into compliance. You're not asking us to, to do anything then, are you? The, the, the recommendation in the memo uh, was to begin the permit uh, reissuance process and so I would say that is a slightly more formal step uh, than just a discussion with the EQ and the reason that was part of our recommendation is because the the impetus for this item coming forward was we had exhausted all other opportunities to get clarity from the state as to how we should handle this this disconnect so our recommendation was to start that process and the ordinances that were that were attached at work session are not adopted by this, but they were to show uh, our staff's best work at how that would come into compliance. Thus, my previous comments about the fact that that could be a potential outcome, and, and if we start the renewal process, that they may just eliminate the language uh, that currently provides those protections in Jordan Lake. That is certainly one outcome. However, given uh, this new language in Chapel Hill, and Burlington, we see an opportunity, and I think council has seen an opportunity that there may be a path that, that DEQ is making available to us for some other protections. And so I think what we're, the, the revision between last Thursday and tonight is saying we can go into this process specifically focused on that language, exploring that language, creating a new and different ordinance than what you've seen tonight. If council's direction is not to start the permit reissuance process, we can do that as well and still ask those questions, but those would be two different actions. The recommended action based on our desire to resolve the conflict uh, was, to, was to start the process. That's, that's actually instructive. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Uh, I recognize Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering what happens if we do nothing? We, we would continue to operate under our current permit until uh, next summer when we would start this process because our current permit is expiring. And we're required, I'm sorry, we're required to go through the permit renewal every, process. Every five years. Every five years. And so, and then if we didn't do that, we would not have a valid permit or we would continue to operate under the if we if we were to move forward tonight with reopening the process we would be in advance of the five-year expiration the five-year expiration will happen next year because of the state law that was passed last year our, our proposal in an attempt to resolve this was to start that process early we would actually have to go through the process again next year even if this is approved is that correct we, we would essentially be going through this process twice. So it, to answer your question, we would continue to operate uh, with the conflict in place and how we have dealt with that since the state law was passed is we continue to honor our permit and enforce our permit. And to be clear, the state law requires us to allow development that might pollute the lake and the we can't really do much about that. The state law was specifically written to say that uh, a local government could not enforce any rules that, uh, among other things, uh, they included a category that said any rules that were in abeyance. A previous state law had put the Jordan Lake rules into abeyance. Therefore, essentially the outcome of that, and Donna, if I didn't describe that correctly enough, but, but you know, the, the, the net effect of that was they instructed local governments that you should not be enforcing these rules. We have continued to enforce the rules because we have a federal permit. Okay, thank you. Yes. Now it's Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. So um, 
I'm sitting here and listening to my colleagues and thinking about this. The, make sure I understand. The state law says that local municipalities cannot enforce the Jordan Lake rules. Don O'Toole, city attorney's office, that's correct. So um, when a community has storm regulations that do enforce the, the state rules, does the state law say they have to revise them? I'm Does sorry. the state law say that municipalities whose stormwater regulations do follow the Jordan Lake rules, d does it require them to revise the rules or simply not enforce the parts? No. And, and what I would say is the 2015 session law, I, I don't think the legislators realized that there may be federal permits that had already been issued right. that were in conflict with the state law. Right. So if we, if we were to revise our federal permit, right? So if the federal what, permit and, were and not we, an issue. We couldn't, we couldn't revise it. It would have to be revised by the Department of Environmental Quality. Thank you for that clarification. If the Department of Environmental Quality were to revise our federal permit, our NPDES permit, would there, why are, so here's my concern. The, somebody got a session law passed that said the rules are in abeyance, you can't enforce them. We have a permit that requires us to do it. We change the permit. Then we change our regulations, and then the state law is revised, and now, we have, now we've got to come back and revise our regulations again. Why don't we just leave our regulations alone and enforce the parts of it that the state laws allow us to enforce? Beca we, because... Our city code provisions, our stormwater performance standards, are actually incorporated into the permit, the federal permit. But we so the federal permit says we shall enforce the ordinances as written. Does Chapel Hills, would Chapel Hills permit have that same provision? I, I have not read Chapel Hills stormwater. Could a the NPDES permit, could a revision of the NPDES per, permit exclude that provision? And I'm not trying to be difficult, but the way the Jordan Lake rules are incorporated into the city stormwater NPDES permit are through our stormwater performance standards that have been approved by the Environmental Management Commission. Basically, DEQ looked at the city of Durham's proposed ordinances that were submitted in 2012, and DEQ checked off that these ordinances comply with both the Falls, Jordan, and Noose rules. And then those rules were submitted to the Environmental Management Commission, and they gave their stamp of approval. And then those rules are now incorporated into our federal permit. And, and what's true is every different jurisdiction, whatever their stormwater performance standards, those are incorporated into their permit. So we all that have different permits. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilman Shul. I'm, I'm sorry. Did you? Well, I, I'm trying to go in order. So I, I I'm see trying. Hands. I'm trying to allow people. To I'm trying. Spoken. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, so, I guess my understanding of this is that if we have a we have developers who are trying to develop in the Jordan Lake Basin, they are um, they are noticing that our permit is out of compliance with the with state law is the issue here that we're going to be sued you know sued by developers who um, and successfully so by developers who notice that we're out of compliance with state law and don't want to pay the extra money that we're requiring them to pay to uh, to come into compliance uh, with our permit Councilman Shul, I can't speak necessarily on behalf of developers, but I would assume that there is an expectation among the development community that the city will comply with the state law that was passed. And that's been the, the challenge here is that there was, I think, an assumption in 2015 when the law was passed that now we know that those Jordan Lake rules won't be enforced. And it was at that time that the attorney's office said, not so fast, you've got a permit that is in conflict with the, uh, the newly passed state law that has to be addressed. Um, and, and the attorney's office, particularly Don O'Toole and the staff, attempted to get that addressed with the DEQ and the prior administration. And I'm paraphrasing here, there was a, you know, yes, that's 
that, that's quite the conundrum, city of Durham. And um, wow, thank you for bringing it to our attention. And that's all the direction that we got. I, don't, I may not even be paraphrasing that. That's um, pretty close. Well, that was actually awesome, Patrick. <laughs> um, so I, I will just say that, that I, I, I am comfortable uh, given what I see, given that explanation and the work that you all have done, of which I'm very appreciative and I know it's incredibly complicated. Uh, and, and given the, what I see here as the kind of second part of the Chapel Hill new permit about at which uh, I believe Don just mentioned, uh, or maybe, I'm not sure, Bo or Don, uh, about the uh, total maximum daily lows, that language, which I think actually does, as I read it, give us some uh, hope that we would have this introduced into our new permit. Uh, given that, I'd be uh, in favor of going ahead with the discussion, uh, but I look forward to any ordinance coming back to us uh, Ordinance changes coming back to us, and I, which I know they will, and uh, so that we have the second shot at, at this. So uh, I'll be supporting that, and uh, and and cautiously optimistic that with the new people uh, at DEQ that we may get a better outcome than we had with the past administration. So thank you all for your work. I recognize the mayor. Oh, Ed, do you have any other? Recognize the mayor pro tem. Uh, my hope is that we will be in compliance with uh, state law, number one, because I know they communicate with the, fe the federal folk as well. So whatever we do, we need to make sure that we are compliant so that uh, we are not sued because I'd hate to see taxpayers' money tied up in a lawsuit. That's Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to make this my last comment. Here, here's my question. Um, when you guys, uh, when we talked at the work session, you had an idea about what the federal permit should look like. Since then, we've seen language that's been included in uh, Chapel Hill and Burlington's permits. When you go to seek changes with DEQ, will you be seeking changes with or without the language that's included in the Chapel Hill permit? First and foremost, I would seek clarification on what the language in the Chapel Hill and Burlington permits mean. Mm -hmm. And when I met with DEQ staff last week, that was one of the issues I addressed. The, the people I met with were very high level and none of them were familiar with this permit language, but they did understand that there are potential problems even with the language that have been inserted into both Chapel Hill and Burlington's permits in that they appear to be including Jordan Lake-like requirements in the permit. So um, if it all gets ironed out and the language or, or a, something similar to it is included in the Chapel Hill permit, would staff be seeking a permit similar to that or without that language? I want, I want to know because what we heard on the work session was without that language. I, I think truthfully, if you're asking the city attorney, I would be asking DO, DEQ to issue a permit to the city of Durham that is in compliance with state law. That's what I would want them to do. Okay. okay. Uh, add anything to that? I, I'm going to entertain a motion on this item. Uh, I support the staff recommendation. I want to get it on the table because I do have one question to ask, but it, it, it's not necessarily pertaining to all of the yeah. stuff we've talked about, but entertain a motion on item. That's so moved. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, the question I have uh, refers to the proposed ordinance changes in the document that you gave us, and it's pretty clear that you've uh, pretty much wiped out uh, Jordan Lake, but the question I have, is the question I raised before, it has to do with detention ponds and the maintenance of them and who's responsible. And if you go to the proposed ordinance changes and section 70-744, remedies for violations, and the last section, section C, injunction, nuance, cost is lien. What I'm trying to understand is can we force the persons who are not in compliance with these detention ponds to either have us correct them and they pay for them? I mean, can we do that? 
I mean, that's, that, that's what is in clearance. It says the city may institute an action in a court of competent jurisdiction for an injunction, order of abatement, or any other equitable remedy not prohibited by law to rem remediate the violation of this article. The city may also maintain an action on GS blah, 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 to remedy condition prejudicial to the public health and safety. Cost of corrections sustained by the city may be assessed as a lien against property. Does that mean the city can go in and correct the pond itself and then put a lien against those property owners? When all other measures fail, we do have that course of action. Yes, sir, we can do that. When all of the courses fail. Yes, yeah, not okay. something we want to do or want to right. entertain because we're not set up to do that. But we give them the opportunity and we go through a notice of violation and enforcement process, and that's our last recourse. Okay. Well, I'll tell you again what, what drives me is mm -hmm. that detention pond over in the Renaissance mm -hmm. Center, which is horrific, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we let it get that long along the way. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's in, in plain sight, mm -hmm. plain sight. That that pond is it's, it's mud, mm. it's mud, and that's in the commercial development. And I don't know why we haven't taken any action to make that happen. I heard what you said before, but mm -hmm. I'm just concerned that how many other ponds do we have around this city that we've permitted that are in similar situations, and we're not doing anything about it. So I I, mm. I really have a concern that we be take strong action that appears we've taken to date to go after these violators and correct them. And if we have to correct it at our price, then make sure that we can recuperate what have we, we, we've done. So I, I just want to understand this last injunctions and this ordinance changes, that, that allows us to do that, I guess you're telling me. That's correct. Okay, good. I recognize Councilman Reese. I, didn't, I was uh, restricting my comments to questions before and I didn't have a chance to actually speak on the measure. I, I wanted to first of all thank the staff so much for your hard work in putting this together. I know it's been a long task. I know that um, DEQ has not put an easy path before you uh, to try to figure out how to reconcile these two issues. Um, and I know that the purpose of having this on our, on our agenda, both at the work session and at the council meeting today, is to try is to ask the council for our guidance about how staff should proceed to try to resolve a conflict that is basically unresolvable under the current situation. We have a valid federal permit that is good through February of 2018, somewhere in that range. Um, we will need to submit a new permit pursuant to the five-year cycle sometime in September of this year. And um, for at least a year between now and February of 18, if we do nothing, we will not be in compliance with state law. But we will be operating under a valid federal permit that is good through that time. Um, and so to my mind, the issue is one of litigation risk. We have a valid permit. We can go forward on that permit and enforce it as, uh, as Bo said. And the risk that we run is a developer would come in and say, no, City of Durham, you're not permitted to enforce that otherwise valid permit because of intervening state law. And I don't think I've heard uh, from anyone a good estimate about whether or not those claims would be successful. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that it is the city attorney's job to limit our risk in that area um, and the staff to provide guidance to us about what they think we ought to do. Uh, having said that, I intend to vote against the measure, but I do appreciate uh, all the work that you did. Thank you. That there are some developers that are being impacted now based on these rules that may not care for if the type of development uh, they're proposing to do. But I, I'm not going to have any more discussion on it. Uh, it's been, we had a motion and a second. Uh, I'm going to open the vote and please vote and close the vote. The motion passes. It fails. It fails. Okay, it failed four to three. Let's, let's move on to the next item. On the public hearings, we have public hearing on FY 2017-2018 budget and FY 2018-2023 capital improvement plan. Good evening, Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. This is a public hearing to receive comments on the fiscal year 2017-2018 budget and capital improvement plan. A second public hearing will be held on Monday, June 5th, after the city manager has presented the proposed budget, which will occur on Monday, May 15th. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there questions by members of the council? If not, uh, we have persons who have signed to speak on this item, and 
as I call your name, if you come to the podium to the right, uh, each speaker has three minutes. And if you just state your name and address, uh, Kimberly Smith, Regina Lewis, Jenny, Jenny Sato, Beth Messer Smith, Daryl Brunson, Alan Freer, Erwin Rutherford and Ryan Johnson, Robin Davis, Larissa Sable, Sandy Dermis, Becky Winders, Wilma Liverpool, Selena Mack, Lanier Bloom. Now, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that's in a public hearing that is not? If you do, if you go to the clerk's desk to my left and sign up, uh, Smith. Uh, you said to uh, I guess everybody knows there's a clock right mm -hmm. in front of me. Thank you. Um, my name is Kimberly Smith, and I reside at 300 North Queen Street. And my family and I are currently living at a wonderful shelter called Families Moving Forward. As rent in Durham increased, housing options for my family became less accessible. We were forced out of one side of town and out of a family home. In that year, we lived in three different houses. We were displaced a lot of times. Now that we were living in a part with a, a town with higher crime, drug activity, smaller living quarters, I struggled to keep my spouse, whose health is plummeting horribly, and my daughters, whose one of them is disabled, housed and with basic needs. We again were forced out of our home two more times into complete homelessness. <clears throat> we had little to no help or support before coming to families moving forward. Coming to the shelter gave my family and myself the ability and courage to believe in community and love. For so many families in Durham, although the specifics are different, the struggle and the outcome are the same. We need the help and support of people and the city where we live. A home is something that is so important to children, to family, and it is something that a child should never have to worry about losing or wonder if they will ever have. As I look back and see, no matter which house we went to, there was always the same common factor, and that was that the rent was too high, the houses were even more to heat and maintain, and the landlords knew that I had no way to change my situation. We need to find a way to bring the high cost of renting down to an affordable maintenance so other families like mine do not enter down the road of homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Re Regina Lewis. Yes. Good evening. Good. My name is Regina Lewis, and I reside at 300 North Queen Street, and I also live in families moving forward. I have three children, two that are, <clears throat> excuse me, two girls that are residing with me at families moving forward. I am currently new to Durham. I love this state. Um, but once I moved somewhere on, in a good neighborhood, the rent increased. That's what led me to move December 7th into families moving forward. I have goals, I have dreams of continuing to be a resident of North Carolina in Durham. As, excuse me, as as I've been resigning and families moving forward, there's been an agency that's been helping me and a lady by the name of Louisa. And she, I signed up for the homeowners program, which I'm trying to become a homeowner within, a one, within one to two years from now. And right now I'm asking if the course in need can support, not just for me, I'm asking for the city to support people like myself and to better housing, affordable housing, um, not just for me, for my children and for the other women that resides at the shelter. 
and their children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hi, good morning, or good evening. Long day. Uh, my name is Janine Sato. I reside at 4125 Livingstone Place in Durham. Um, I'm a nearly 20 year resident of the city and I'm a mom of two DPS kids and I'm also a North Carolina Moms Rising member. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment on the budget. I'm here today to request that the council consider paid family leave in the next fiscal year budget. Um, and I'm going to tell you two brief stories about why I believe this issue is so impactful to our families. Uh, the first is personal as, as a parent. Um, when I gave birth to my first child, I worked for a, what I thought a good company and thought I was eligible for Family Medical Leave Act, which would have entitled me to some unpaid leave, but unfortunately I found out that I, would, like many people in America, are not eligible for FMLA. Um, and so that left me with very few options, and I was asked to return to work after six weeks. I was grateful for that. Um, although that certainly wasn't enough time for me. Um, and when that organization told me that news, I felt pretty honestly blindsided by it and betrayed as a good employee. Um, and I went back, but as soon as I did, I started looking for another position. And um, fortunately, I was able to change jobs and find another job that offered paid family leave, and I specifically sought that out. Um, so I had a really interesting exit interview with that organization and told them that that's specifically why I left. Uh, they'd actually given me a big raise before I gave birth and I said I'd give the money back if you would only had given me some time with my newborn child. Um, to me, that's part of the full compensation package and uh, something that I wouldn't consider um, a job without at this point. So I, from a business perspective, I feel like uh, paid family leave is not only just a competitive decision, it's a, the right thing to do for families, um, and it also um, supports families in our community. The second part of my story is the second job that I took after that. Oh, I'm timed out. I, I worked for Durham Connects for years and saw many families going back to work just days after giving birth for seven years, and that's our community members and I think that this is a decision that will reap rewards for all of us. As a taxpayer, I encourage you to suggest them and consider it. Thank you. You're welcome. Beth Messersmith. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name's Beth Messersmith. I live at Seven Beach Slopeway in Durham. Um, I also have the privilege of serving as the state campaign director for Moms Rising. We're a group of more than 42,000 moms, dads, aunts, uncles, and grandparents who are working to build a more family-friendly state and nation. And I'm also here to encourage you to take up paid parental leave um, as something that you offer to Durham City employees. As an organization that focuses on family economic security, we've been thrilled to see a number of other local governments, including Durham County, Wake County, Cary, Greensboro, and the town of Rollsville, join the employers who are providing this important benefit. It's incredibly important. Right now, as many as 65% of working mothers nationally can't, aren't eligible for or can't afford to take advantage of the Family Medical Leave Act, which provides 12 weeks of unpaid parental leave. One in four moms returns to work within 10 days of giving birth, and nearly 12% are back at work within one week. That's simply not acceptable. There's so much time that families will lose that they could be bonding that they'll never get back, and it cre also creates financial shortfalls at a time that families really need this type of support. Health impacts have led the Child Fatality Task Force to study paid parental leave, the Child Fatality Prevention Teams to um, make this a top recommendation, and it's also the perinatal health team to include this in the draft perinatal health plan. Um, in studies, we've also seen that this has significant impacts for business. You all might have seen the News and Observer article yesterday talking about how many businesses here in the Triangle and statewide are providing this type of benefit to their employees. Um, those include Blue Cross Blue Shield, Duke Energy, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and many more. Among these reasons that they cite are com increased competitiveness, decreased turnover, and increased loyalty amongst their employees. The citizens of Durham um, have great, there's a great staff that works for the city of Durham, and they deserve this kind of benefit as well so that they can take care of their families when they need to. Thank you very much for your consideration. You're welcome. And I have handouts. Can I give them to the this clerk? clerk, if you don't mind. Daryl Brunson. Good evening. Um, Daryl Brunson, 1515 Kendall Drive. And I'm on the behalf of the City Workers Union. And I emailed 
y'all um, afford y'all the council our budget proposal to try to save time. Um, but after hearing some of these stories, I think the main thing that we do need to address is four months paid parental leave for um, people that you know have children or adopted children. Um, also, 2,500 across the board wage for all city employees, progressive health care premiums where the employee contribution um, for their premium is based on their salary, 50% discount on parks and recreation programs and classes for employees and their spouses and children, um, a fair grievance procedure with an added civil service board, hire long-term temp employees into full-time permanent positions, and a reforms civilian review board, as well as a formal meet and confer resolution. Um, all these things that I mentioned is just a summary, but it goes into more detail. Um, so I just wanted to save time and you know to give other people an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, you said you mailed something. I email. Email it to our city, city council. Address. I haven't received it. Okay, I'll make sure you. Okay, um, thank you. Anyone else? You didn't? Okay, I'll make sure you get it. All right, thank you. Alan Freya. Good evening. It's, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. My name is Alan Fryer. I wear two hats tonight. I reside at 401 North Gregson Street here in Durham. Uh, I'm also the Director of Workers' Rights at the North Carolina Justice Center, and I'm also here representing the People's Alliance uh, Durham Living Wage Project. Uh, and I want to talk about two things very quickly. I want to follow my friends and colleagues who have talked about the importance of paid leave, paid parental leave for uh, Durham City workers. Um, as you know, the Federal Family uh, and Medical Leave Act provides uh, up to 90 days of unpaid leave for workers. Um, to take time off to uh, care for their families and um, uh, bond with their children and recover from pregnancy and birth. Unfortunately, too many workers can't afford to take unpaid leave, and so that's why there's been a growing number of private employers and uh, local governments that have taken it upon themselves to provide this important benefit um, to their own workers to make sure that they have um, these crucial opportunities to fully recover uh, and bond as family members. Uh, and so I'm, I'm gr gratified that y'all have, have, have shown interest in this proposal and, having, uh, and I would urge you uh, respectfully to include it uh, in the next fiscal year's budget. Um, it is really good news for employers, uh, not just for the workers themselves, um, but there is a significant and growing body of research by professional economists, I am not one, um, but uh, I read their work, and it shows that increasingly this type of benefit is crucial for improving employer productivity. Um, it reduces turnover, uh, and the story that Janine shared, too many folks end up leaving um, their work because they don't have access to this benefit. Um, uh, women employees in particular also have the opportunity to, um, to use this. Uh, in a way that increases their attachment to the labor force over the long term. So what this means is that you're able to keep your most highly skilled um, female employees uh, when, it, uh, when they would be otherwise more likely to leave. Um, I have 10 seconds apparently. I might speak a little bit over. Um, I'm also here representing the Durham Living Wage Project. Um, my understanding is that they have submitted their proposal to you all already to ensure that the um, uh, the living wage ordinance that y'all have already passed would be expanded to include part-time workers. Uh, and my understanding is that um, uh, this actually is not terribly expensive for the city. They don't think it would uh, include more than 120 folks and wouldn't cost much more than about a half million dollars. So I would urge you to include that proposal as well in your budget. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. You're welcome. I have Aaron Rutherford and Ryan Johnson. Is that correct? My name is Erin Rutherford. This is my husband, Ryan Johnson. We live at 821 Demarius Street in Durham. In the 1960s, the Loop Project was sold to the city administration as a way to remodel the city into a mall, completely free of traffic hazards and interference, and providing the comfort, convenience, safety, and delight of the pedestrian shopper. Unfortunately, it seems to have accomplished quite the opposite. The project seems to have created a barrier to downtown, a moat of cars, if you will, compromising pedestrian safety 
and disabling residents from conveniently walking because of high speed, inappropriately scaled one-way roads. In the end, 1,778,000 square feet of area was cleared. 229 structures were raised to the ground. The cost in 1972 was just over $13 million, which is the equivalent of about $76.3 million today. I'm a part of a citizens advocacy group working to encourage the city to transform the downtown loop by restoring the historic grid structure and making the loop a two-way street. In its current form, the downtown loop is still unsafe for pedestrians, an inefficient use of valuable downtown land, and a dead zone for retail and other commercial activity. It's time for the city to make investments necessary to improve the loop and to prioritize the creation of restorative infrastructure design that corrects past mistakes, improves pedestrian and bicycle mobility, and reconnects people and neighborhoods by this opportunity. Our downtown has witnessed an incredible transformation over the last decade. As Durham's 150th anniversary approaches in 2019, I hope that you will prioritize de-looping the center as the critical next step towards building a strong and sustainable downtown. Thank you. You're welcome. Larissa Seibel. Good evening, my name is Larissa Seibel at 2410 Park Place. And I wanted to speak on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. We support the requests that are, that are being made tonight to help homeless families find safe, stable homes and to fund repairs of uh, rental homes that Durham Community Land Trustees recently bought in Northeast Central Durham, as well as to restart funding for our home buyer program, which inspires so many people to try to buy homes and try to stay in this community, but is, um, right now without those funds, it's very difficult for first time lower income home buyers to be able to afford to buy in Durham. And finally, we want you to help homeowners stay in their homes, uh, both uh, with home repairs to address uh, uh, health and safety issues like lead and mold, leaking roofs, uh, heating systems, and also to help people who have extraordinary tax increases. And um, as we look forward uh, to implementing your five-year affordable housing plan, we think all of these uh, issues are so important, and let's start this year with funding those most urgent needs. Thank you. Welcome. Sandy. To Mercy, I can't write the last, read the last name. Demery, Sandy Demery. Demery, okay, thank yes. you. I uh, live at 819 North Street here in Durham, and I'm here to support DCLT's request for funding. And uh, it really is because I love Durham so much, and the reason I love Durham so much is the diversity. And I moved here from Raleigh, <laughs> and so I got the diversity, and I was in the West End, and uh, as many of you know, I was the president for quite a few years and became a DCLT board member. And then I moved to North Street Community, which is downtown for people with disabilities and friends. And um, then what happened in the city, all of a sudden, this gentrification went crazy. And I've been over to the West End recently, and guess what? Miss Harris can still live there the folks who needed affordable housing can still live there, uh, even though some of the private market folks are putting up $500,000 buildings. Um, DCLT has the reputation for good cost-effective use of your funds and uh, great energy efficiency and well-built homes. Uh, we encourage neighborhood engagement. In fact, I've led a lot of that myself for quite a few years. Um, I'm familiar with affordable housing organizations and we're all good in the city and we all need funding. Uh, DCLT offers permanent affordable housing and that's so important to me because I plan to live to be 120 years old in good health. Uh, and in fact, uh, my husband and I are just changing our wills right now that we're planning to leave the two buildings that we have with five rental units to DCLT because how else are we gonna keep the place diverse? So 
please fund DCLT as much as you can. Thank you. Uh, Becky Winders. My name is Becky Winders, and I live at 1304 Seton Road, and Sandy just said a bunch of the things that I was going to say. Um, I'm here representing the uh, uh, Durham Community Land Trust, and uh, I think like uh, Sandy, uh, I, I volunteer for this organization because housing is such a fundamental foundational need and because the Durham DCLT is um, a reliable, business-like, uh, non nonprofit um, uh, who's committed to ha uh, managing and developing permanent affordable housing. And I'm, I'm acutely aware that 15,000 of Durham's low-income families are paying more than, or households are pay paying more than 50% um, of their income for housing. And that was as of 2012. And uh, as we drive around town, we see all these n uh, nicely fixed up houses and uh, they, and uh, they, a lot of those houses are, and the work that's being done is causing people to get, uh, uh, thrown out of their houses or having to leave their houses because they can't afford the rent. Uh, so um, in, in 2016, Durham uh, DCLT um, learned that a local landlord planned to sell 54 occupied homes on, on 31 lots. And uh, we knew that market-driven investors would demolish or renovate these homes and increase the rents and either way to displacing the, the families. So in December, DCLT borrowed 1.9 million from the Self-Help Ventures Fund to purchase these, these houses and uh, saved these people from, from displacement. But the houses are not in, in great con condition and we, need, we now need a lot of help to just to make the basic uh, uh, things to keep the, keep the house safe and and, uh, and then also we need to upgrade those houses to give them their 30 years of life. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wilma Liverpool. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Wilma Liverpool. I reside at 616 Nash Street. I am a lifelong Durham resident. Some time ago, I was involved in a conversation with a group of seniors. The subject turned to needs that we seniors face, and it came around to dangerous trees. But a lot of times, it seems as if those in my community are usually left with our dignity bruised when we consider things we have need of. We are still able to safely live independently. We agreed we needed dangerous trees seriously topped or trimmed, but preferably removed. Due to living with fixed incomes, we are forced to live in stressful fear whenever heavy wind or rainstorms are predicted. I've been through Durham City and county officials, but our needs don't qualify us for any services. I've had the trees inspected on this group that I've been working with, and I've gotten private estimates for the trees on my property, $3,975. Durham officials have referred me to volunteer groups in Wake County, to Urban Forestry, North Carolina Baptist Ministry, and TROSA, but none were in a position to help us. I have pictures I want to leave with you, but the oldest person in our group in her 80s had a tree break and fall. One week, part of it fell against her house the second time it came down and actually hit her house. We have um, an incident of two cars being demolished because the trees came down and they were totaled. We just feel like we are not being heard and we are not being really respected. We've paid taxes and we're not slackers.
Uh, Selena Mack, Lanier Blum, and Good evening, I'm Selena Mack, um, the Executive Director of Durham Community Land Trustees, 1208 West Chapel Hill Street, Durham, North Carolina. As a general rule, uh, in terms of with regards to housing condition, DCLT doesn't, we don't ask our residents to live in housing conditions that we wouldn't personally live in ourselves. Um, as Becky indicated, we acquired 54 units recently that are, in, that are not in great condition. And that is certainly not the current situation for, those, for these uh, housing units. Um, but we're committed to improving the housing conditions of these units along with the quality of life of these residents. And while the need is greater than, much greater than um, we, any single source, and you, you, Lanier actually passed out a, a, a form a few minutes ago, so you have some general idea of what the what we think, what we're estimating the need to be at this point. We realize that it is greater than any single source of, of funding, um, but we are asking for your help uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, the 2016 um, housing goals that were passed clearly indicate the need for permanently affordable rental units for low to moderate income um, residents, and particularly for l very low income residents. And DCLT would like to um, work in partnership with the city um, as a conduit for making permanently affordable rental housing a reality. Thank you. Uh, next is Lanier Blum. Now, is anyone else that hasn't spoken and wants to speak on this item? Okay. Um, you can state your name and address when you come forth and sign up. Lanier. Good evening. I'm Lanier Blum. I live at 11 Up Church Circle in Durham. And I'm speaking tonight as a board member of the Durham Community Land Trustees. Um, thank you very much for this budget hearing and all the opportunities you're giving us to participate this year. I think it will be great if the city um, does, as a matter of routine, talk to nonprofit partners every year before the budget is presented and learn what all of the needs and um, projects on their boards are. Um, in the case of Durham, we've um, provided a handout that lists our highest priority needs. These are all things that we really need to do this year, and we have a growing list of projects that we're looking forward to doing next year. This is our 30th anniversary, and then as we look ahead to the next one in five and 30 years, we have some extremely exciting plans to share with you. Um, why invest in Durham Community Land Trustees? I'm gonna quickly give you eight reasons. One is, that Durham Community Land Trustees does have 30 years of solid, steady, strong standard for providing houses for low-income people. And also our homes are attractive assets for the surrounding neighborhood. Second, Durham Community Land Trustees makes the most of every city dollar by cost-effective, nonprofit-level budgeting. When you look at the cost per house of these projects, you see the benefits of preservation, and you see the benefits of nonprofit work at a local organization that provides jobs as well as housing in our community. Um, third, um, when we budget, we budget first for energy efficiency and durability so that our homes will last forever because they will be permanently affordable and we have to sustain them for the long haul. And I have to tell you the rest another time. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Robin Davis. I um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Could, could you give your address, please? Yeah, 1101 Spruce Street. Um, I wanted to speak with uh, you, you about budgeting for low quality, low income housing. I am now, um, on the 16th of March, will be in my house for a year through Habitat. Prior to that, I lived nine years in a house that was so substandard that my electric bill was $700 a month. I was taking antibiotics every other day because of the mold. Uh, my children have asthma. 
Um, I have I've been sick within this year that I've been in my Habitat home, however, never to the point of being hospitalized. Whereas before I had to be kept in the uh, emergency room for at least three days before they could even safely put me upstairs on the floor. Um, we need good quality housing. Um, being low income, I was stuck. I, was, I, was, I wanted to do better, I couldn't do better. Not paying $750 in rent than $750 in just the electric alone. Um, I tried to look through, you know, tried to go about looking at other options. Um, the houses that come up for auction, well, I never had the money. And even if I did have a little money, I felt like um, someone, you know, bigger corporations or whatever would be able to over bid me. Um, Durham is the city of medicine. No one should be living uh, in ho homes that are s s in such disrepair that they're sick, either financially sick, they are mentally sick from the stress, or physically sick. Um, and you know, you're worrying about your children, you're trying to do better and you can't. So I would love to um, know if there's any way that you all can set a part of like the, the houses that the city takes for, um, to put up for auction for, uh, you know, if they're behind in their taxes or something. Is there a way that some of those houses can be set aside for low income persons? You, you're asking. I mean, that's a question. I'm, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me ask, is it anyone else that would like to speak that has not had an opportunity to speak, this being the budget consideration? If not, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak on this item. Uh, I'll declare the public hearing to be closed and entertain a motion that we accept the comments as Mr. part Mayor. of the public record. I move that we accept the comments as a part of the public record. I'll, I'll second. I have a comment. You have a comment? Yeah, I, w I want to thank folks for coming out tonight. Um, and a lot of the comments tonight were around, there were a lot of different issues. I made notes in all of them, but a lot of issues around affordable housing. And this, of course, is a big issue facing us, one that we're very much aware of, and one I look forward to, you know, putting some real um, real underpinnings underneath the, the strategies and plans that we've been talking about. So thank you all for coming out. Okay. Are you, are you going to say something, Mayor Proctor? No, I just want to see Karina before she leaves. Oh, okay. Our, if there are no further items to come before the council, meetings adjourned. Okay. Do I have another item on here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get out here too soon. Oh, to vote on the public hearing, that no matter. Uh, open the vote. Close the vote. The motion passes 7 0. All right, thank you. Are uh, there any other items to come before the council? If not, we're adjourned at 9 12 p.m. Thank you.